happy here to see the altitude. We've got no altitude elevation. Um, no, no conflicts. In fact, I was thinking about it. What would be a conflict? Definitely did not take money. So I'm going to start with the quiz. Um, I want you to, to think about this. I'm really uh, I'm not going to put you on the spot. But think if, if you were for us, you know, were taking a, a test, supposed to be having to make a decision, what would you say the effect of being at a higher altitude is on all of these conditions? So how long people live, uh, heart disease, sleeping, mortality, uh, death by suicide, increase of depression, which may be into protein or methamphetamine use and then death. So I'll give you a hint, the answer is not one way or the other for So higher altitude, exactly. So how much higher? So how many linear, linear trends? The linear relationship between the higher you go, the bigger the trend of the So what I want to, instead of you know, directly addressing this, which I'll be, I'll be doing along the way, um, what I want to do is uh, get you to think like, why are you willing to consider this? So the question is, actually, what makes you willing to accept that might be a possibility? But maybe the obvious answer is actually going to talk about it. Not only is it a part, but it's a grand round, so there must be some of them. But um, that, that's not really the answer. So the question is, what is it that you assume is different about the So real, real quick review of, of what some of those differences there, there may be others. So, a uh, little pie chart up there is a reminder of, of what we breathe. Um, so, what's most of the, the air around us made up Nitrogen. It's almost all nitrogen, basically, in there, it does nothing. And the, the red track. Oxygen, right? So, uh, that's uh, what the fluid that, that has affected by changes in elevation. And, I have forgotten about this, um, but CO2 is very, very small. Zero percent or something. I uh, have a pulmonary dysfunction. I'm working on this on the yeah. <laughs> the higher you get, the less. And more um, you can see that there is significant altitude in the Consider Might differ um, to, to lower. Um, so things when is it hotter or colder? No. Cooler, right? Um, sun, something up there. You definitely have differences in um, sun exposure. Uh, there may be other environmental effects. I'll point out some of the uh, differences related to minerals. Mineral intake that, that uh, probably uh, is affected different altitudes, and then just you know the type of life people have is different. There's few big cities really high up, and more smaller places or more rural places that people live, and that may have uh, significant effects on who they are and, and their other risk factors. And there there are other things too. So I just ask you to to think broadly and, and to not make assumptions that this is just the air. So I want to start way back. Um, 
and, and this is, is just a kick to see the, the way you could write an article in 1946. These two slides are the whole article. Wouldn't it be great if you could do that now, you know, sit down, write a couple paragraphs and send it in and have, have an article. But th this is the, the backdrop, um, scientific backdrop. And basically these, these guys did this study in guinea pigs and a number of other studies where they exposed guinea pigs to high altitude. They hadn't born in high altitude, hadn't lived there, and then looked at their behavior and their brains. And their finding was what they ended, ended with here, that they, there really is nothing. And I think that's, that was the kind of going wisdom um, for most of the, um, you know, after, after these initial investigations was, well, people acclimate to altitude, there may be some effects on certain bodily systems, but really people are made to live at a variety of, of altitudes and you don't assume that any of it is going to be pathogenic. Um, so it, it was kind of surprising uh, when people started looking at this to, to find that there are in fact some differences. Um, I'm going to first focus on the uh, life expectancy part of it and co medical comorbidities and, and then look at the psychiatric part. Um, so, so it is somewhat surprising that you, you might find differences based on uh, elevation in, in terms of these uh, real effects. So this is a, a, a graph of the elevation of the U.S. Um, on the top and then life expectancy for males and females on the bottom. You can see there's, there's sort of a pattern there um, insofar as the people who live in the southeast um, where it's flatter, that's like the lowest part of the whole country seem to live um, shorter than the people who live in the mountainous states. Uh, so, you know, just as a, a visual trend, maybe there's something there. And then when they broke down the um, life expectancy based on altitude ranges, you can see there's a, a little bit of a trend there. Um, as people get to higher elevations, they seem to live longer. So, and they, they did the uh, regression model, the, the thing you'd obviously say is, well, you know, maybe there's differences, but the people who live in these, these places are different also, and they are experiencing uh, different um, socioeconomic uh, influences and different health-related influences. So they included some things in their model. And this is just absolutely baffling to me. Mormon population fraction, that was the only religious-related variable they included here. Um, I, I'm just flabbergasted as to how they got the, that variable in their models. If people with uh, Mormon populations, about 1.7% of the U.S. population. And to assume that that's going to have some generalized effect, it's, it's beyond me. So if anybody's got a, a good explanation for this, let me know. Yeah? So actually in Utah, they have a huge database and human genetic samples that are being collected and a very large fraction of that is Mormon, because the state is 70% Mormon. So they have a lot of sample availability and hmm. a lot of researchers doing human genetics. Yeah, so that, that, that's a great point. I could see if this was a study in Utah, that would make a lot of sense, but when it's a, a U.S. study, it's very hard to connect. So anyways, just an interesting point, and then we'll see, there's a, another um, spin on, on this uh, where somebody controlled for Roman Catholic. Um, but but nothing else. So uh, maybe uh, people are you know when they think altitude, they're thinking closest to heaven or something. I don't, I don't know. So anyways, when when they look controlled for all these other factors, these guys found there really was no relationship with altitude and life expectancy. Um, that in unadjusted models, people lived a couple of years longer when they happened to reside at high altitudes, um, but that after you adjust, it's not significant. And when they broke it down by comorbidities. Uh, they found that people who had uh, that the, the likelihood of dying from cardiac disease, um, this ischemic heart disease, was lower at higher altitudes, but the likelihood of dying from COPD or lung related causes was higher, and those balanced each other out. And this would make some uh, sense or physiologically if you think that people's hematocrits might be a little bit higher um, when, when they're uh, at at altitude or there may be other some downstream effects. So that, that's just the, the general background of, uh, of life expectancy. So this is the first paper um, just about six years ago that looked at any psychiatric variable and uh, the relationship to altitude. 
And these guys took the states in the, the United States and then the suicide rates that were published um, from 2004 to 2006 and um, plotted them on a scatter plot. Um, and the, the graph on the left used the highest elevation in the state, which I hope you'll realize is a, a little bit fishy. It's like the, just the fact that you can look up to a high point in your state, even though you're living down lower, would increase your rate for suicide. It just that doesn't add up much. I'm I'm still baffled as to why they even uh, would have included that. Um, and we'll get into this issue in a, a little more uh, nitty gritty detail. So the one on the right used the elevation of the state capital as the basis for um, for determining what the altitude was, and that's a little fishy too because you know, a lot of states you can think of the state capital is not exactly at the mean of the, the state and it may be very high or low. Yeah? Um, can they also take into account, like you mentioned earlier in the guinea pig case study, they have the guinea pig born at an altitude and like do they take Fantastic question. You know, people move around a lot and you can't assume that where somebody is, you know, at, at this time it was the suicide event for that particular state that that really was where, where they were from. So. They, they, so yeah, what's, what's funny about this, as I've worked through it more, is the hardest technical problem is not really determining the rates of psychiatric disease or event, it's rather figuring out what an, a reasonable approximation for the altitude of that is. Um, and picking the highest altitude in the state really is, is not a very smart way to do it, or you know, making assumptions that wherever somebody's life ended was, was where they spent most of their time. So that's a, a great point, and that's a, a real confounder to consider. So, um, but then the, you know the, this was one one finding, um, and since then other people have gotten interested in this and spun it a number of different ways. And I'll I'll give you the uh, uh, some of some of these other findings. Uh, so in the U.S., people uh, when they looked at this uh, and replied to the initial article said. Well, it's because you know these are more rural areas, and people have gun, more guns in rural areas, so it's probably an artifact of uh, firearm ownership rates, and people are you know committing suicide more by by firearm, and that's a more successful form of suicide. So this uh, group out of the University of Utah did an, another analysis with a much bigger sample. This was uh, you know 20 years of data across the the U.S and sub-state regions instead of the states themselves, and they controlled for firearm ownership. Um, and when they, they controlled for all of that, they found that uh, the trend remained. So on the left is the overall um, suicide rate uh, per 100,000. You can see in, you know, on average it's about 20, um, and that'll be important when we compare this to other countries. And then the middle one is by death by firearms, suicide by firearms. And then the one on the right is non-firearm suicide. So um, the add additive uh, effect of these, you know, it's just the two two right graphs added up to each other make the, the left graph. And you can see there's there's a, a trend. I mean, just just looking at that, you'd uh, be hard pressed to say that there really is no effective altitude, and it doesn't seem to be just based on whether the uh, death was by firearm or not. So the, the pe people um, were interested in looking at other countries too, and this is data from Korea, where uh, they looked at the sub-state regions, or the districts, I guess, which are you know, pretty small areas, um, and found that there's the same sort of trend holds with uh, suicide, death, and altitude of residents, even after you control for socio-demographic factors. And you'll notice that the average rate here is about 25. So a little bit higher than in the United States. So th things get uh, interesting when you uh, start to consider what the other factors might be. I'm going to list, go, go into this in a little bit of detail, and then at the end list a bunch of the other potential confounding factors. This one is particular to lithium. So these uh, guys looked at the suicide rates and altitude levels uh, in Austria, and the, on the, the top graph, that's the suicide mortality ratio. Unfortunately, I was never able to figure out how to convert this to like suicides per 100,000. I, I have no idea how they did it, but darker is more suicides. And then the bottom graph is the altitude. So the uh, western part of Austria is mainly the Alps, bordering Italy there, and, and that's higher. And you, can, you when you look at these, you see, yeah, there's a, 
looks like there's more suicides in the, the places that are higher. But then they decided to look at the lithium level in the drinking water. And when you look at this graph, it looks like suicides are more common in places where there's not much lithium in the water um, and not the necessarily the higher altitude ones. And what they, they found this very strong linear correlation between higher altitude and lower lithium, which, which makes nice sense because like maybe the lithium's washing down from the mountains and it's collecting more at lower altitudes. So when they did their, their adjusted models to figure out what the relative effects were, they controlled for as many variables as, as they could. Um, here, here they controlled for pr proportion Roman Catholic, which is also kind of odd because across all the, the uh, districts in Austria, the lowest rate was 75% and the highest rate was 84%. So it's not like there's a, a lot of heterogeneity there, but you'll, you'll see that it, it still was an important effect. And then they also controlled for how many psychiatrists and uh, psychotherapists there were and gen uh, general practitioners and uh, unemployment rate. So it's kind of a, you know, they didn't control well for sociodemographic characteristics, uh, but they did seem to control for other things that might affect suicide rate. And when they put all this together, um, it looks like uh, the, the SF is just a suicide fraction. That's like a constant term. Uh, Roman Catholic there seemed to have the, the biggest effect. So the more Roman Catholics there were, the higher the rate of suicide. Um, that was about comparable to the effect of low lithium. Um, and then altitude had a small effect, but it wasn't nearly the same as the effect of lithium. Um, unemployment was about comparable to altitude. Um, and then the int, int is the interaction term between uh, altitude and lithium. Level. So this suggests that there may be, you know, an important intermediary that has to do with what people are ingesting rather than the, the air they're breathing, but it, it doesn't really answer the question exactly. Um, the, the only additional uh, work uh, that's been done um, looking, looking at rates of suicide and altitude is a study out of Turkey. Um, and the, the methodology is kind of questionable on this one, I gotta, I gotta say. Um, the way of ascertaining suicides was not real clear. Um, and the, the rate is really pretty low there. Uh, so four per 100,000, yeah. They were able to measure the number of suicides to uh, four significant digits though. Well, yeah, you, that's a good point. <laughs> no, that's a, no, that's that's a very good point. That I would, the more number, you know, digits you put on, the, the better the study is. But this one, so you know, if you put all these together and you were really pressed, maybe you'd say, well, you know, the altitude affects suicide rates when there's a lot of suicides, but if it's a, a low background rate, it doesn't have an effect. Or there's cultural differences. Uh, that determine this, or that there's some other effect about altitude that's related to some other factor in the United States and Austria um, that, that isn't seen in uh, Turkey. So clearly not a not a straightforward answer. Yeah. About that Austrian study, I, I looked at that one and did the back of the envelope calculations on what that what the um, amount of looking the data would amount to the hill would be. Something less than five million. Interesting. So it's not a lot. Not a lot, yeah. Well, there's all the, the other data about you know lithium in the drinking water and suicide rates. And what at the very end of the, the talk, I'll give it away now. The problem is the trend with higher altitude and lower lithium is reversed in the United States. So in the US, there's more lithium at higher altitudes. So that that whole idea um, that people have higher risk of suicide at higher elevations because there's less, less lithium up there just simply doesn't hold up scientifically when you, you look around the world. It's probably just an artifact of uh, you know, this little part of one continent and how lithium is distributed there rather than being a general trend around the world. And that's a, that's a great, great point about the uh, levels of lithium and what else you'd have to adjust for in order to ensure that you, you really had a, a true finding there. Yeah. Did they measure blood levels to assess how much lithium people were actually taking? Because some parts of the U.S. people drink a lot of bottled water or they filter it. Or mm -hmm. They use the fluid filters to take out all the 
Great, great point. Yeah. yeah, and I, you know, Chris, you, you know this literature pretty well, I think. I don't think anybody's really done a big study of you know, just uh, community lithium levels and risk of psychiatric disease. Um, We've done it with violence like in Texas and Oklahoma, where they look at communities of not too far or distant, or sociologically very similar. And cities that had more lithium and had fewer, less violence. Less violent deaths, right? Yeah. And I, I think that was based off just the water supply and not flood levels. Yeah. All right, so let's let's look at some of these other other conditions besides uh, suicide rates. So this is the only study done of uh, rates of de depression. This is the National um, Survey of Drug Use and Health, NSDA, um, and they had a measure in this of uh, people's psychological distress in the last year it's by self-report, and then whether um, they had symptoms consistent with major depression. This wasn't a real clinical diagnosis. But here again, it uh, looks like on, on a sub-state region, the higher you get, the more people are depressed or psych psychologically distressed. Um, so I, I, uh, I wish there was a more systematic way to organize all the results, but basically people have just picked out little conditions to look, to look at. Um, Nobody's looked at bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, as, as far as I know. Um, so we'll, we'll go through methamphetamine use, cocaine, and ADHD. Um, so this, this is the, the study that has the cleanest line you know, when, you, when you look at al altitude versus rate. And this is the rate of meth use uh, in the last year on a large survey by self-report. And it sure looks like if you get to a higher altitude, you're much more likely to use meth than, than you are at a lower altitude. Um, my, my guess is that this is largely confounded by rurality, but hard hard to say, and they did not well adjust for that. And in fact, it's, it's kind of hard to adjust for well on a state basis, because there's only 50 points on there. Um, the same group uh, looked at cocaine use. I think it was a, a spin-off paper that they couldn't resist. Um, this one doesn't really look that convincing to me. You got to squint from across the room to, to see there's a line there, and the, the the trend isn't isn't that significant. But there's at least some indication that the higher higher up you get, the more likely people are to be uh, abusing or, or using cocaine and methamphetamine. Yeah, it probably refutes a complaint they got in the <laughs> earlier study where they said it was a demographic thing, like Democratic oh, counties, good point. Democratic and use cocaine and Republican. Good, great point. Yeah, so it, I guess it would be a, a drug drug from the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, so that that may be it. Um, I hadn't hadn't thought about that angle, but that would make sense as to why you'd look at it. Um, and I'm su surprised they didn't present other other results too, because this survey included a lot of different drugs, like alcohol. Um, nobody's published on that. My my guess is probably they've done the analyses and they weren't <laughs> interesting enough to publish, or it was a negative effect. So probably what we're seeing in all this is a bias towards publishing significant results, and everything else that was was done has not been mentioned. So this is is the the one that I, I found most interesting, and this was my my impetus for getting um, getting in, involved in this domain. Uh, this was a paper that came out last year. Um, looking at ADHD. I mean, we consider ADHD to be a pretty biological disease. Um, you know, there's a lot of good gen genetics uh, work to identify, you know, exactly what the candidate genes are with, with dopamine. But when they looked at, at state altitude and rates of ADHD, they found a pretty significant result. I have no idea why they did it per foot of elevation. So it's 0.001% increase in ADHD rate per foot of elevation increased, which is and really hard, hard to interpret. Um, but if you compare it to the other findings there, so low birth weight, which we know is a risk for ADHD, was roughly comparable to a 1,000 foot decline in elevation. So if you're higher, higher, if you're 1,000 feet higher, that basically cancels out the effect of low birth weight in the adjusted models. So this was, is a um, re remarkably strong finding for what, what I would consider to, to be you know, something that we consider a very biological disease and with a lot of heterogeneity. 
So kind of kind of hard hard to explain otherwise. There may also be issues with re reporting, or if you've got more um, people who diagnose ADHD in large cities, which are more at low low uh, state or low elevation states, then that this would explain it. But they they were able to account for that that somewhat. So that's what got me interested, and I want to tell you my my story of uh, of looking into this now. So I'm a geriatrics guy, and all that other stuff doesn't really matter to me. It's dementia that, that's the most important thing, and it's the, that's the key public health problem in our country. In case you haven't realized that already, um, so I, I figured it'd be easy to do an analysis to to look at uh, dementia and altitude, you know, based on these other guys' successes. Like I made the wrong assumption up front that you could just on the internet get a list of what the altitudes of various uh, regions are and reasonable data about dementia rates. So I found this uh, report by the Alzheimer's Association that listed the dementia rates for the 50 states and it said it was from this article called Prevalence of Alzheimer's Disease in U.S. States um, and it's got the rate in 2015 and what the rate is projected to be 10 years later and I got the the al average altitude of the 50 states, which you can find pretty easily and graphed it, and it's like, hey, you know, there's a trend here. This is good, good stuff. Um, now let me just adjust for all those socio-demographic variables. And when I, <laughs> and it, you know, this, this is fishy. Something is, is wrong here. Um, so when I adjusted for age, sex, and race, it looked like all the values were just the same. I did, it, it, some, something is wrong here. So I went to the article, and sure enough, these guys claimed to present rates for the 50 states, and all they did was took the rate for one little community in Chicago, and then extrapolated that to every state based on its age distribution, sex distribution, and uh, race distribution. Which, you can't call your article prevalence of a disease in the states, and really just mean that it's a prevalence, you know, it's the all we're showing is the uh, age and sex distribution of people and then extrapolating what the dementia rate should be. So this got me pretty pretty angry um, that, that uh, pe people are, are making assumptions just purely off extrapolation. So I, I went, went looking to find real Alzheimer's data and, and recognized in the process that every state has a slightly different program for um, ascertaining uh, cases of, of uh, different illness, and there really is no good national estimate for what the, the dementia rates are, either for the whole country, which is why these guys use Chicago, uh, or for states in particular. So the idea of um, being able to measure rates of Alzheimer's disease um, is, is impossible <coughs> given our current data set. However, deaths attributable to d dementia are a little bit more straightforward. And California has a, a wonderful public health department that makes all of their, their data available. And in this report, um, they showed what the rates of death for Alzheimer's were uh, between 2003 and 2005 by each of the counties in California. And I triple checked to make sure that these were the you know, real numbers of deaths instead of just estimates of what they, they should have been. Um, and in this report, they include this uh, nice figure that makes it look like there's pretty significant regional variations. You know, when you look at the scale, um, the, the darker blue ones are about double or more what the, the light ones are, and it looks like the higher rates really track down the Central Valley of California, which is all lowland, and the higher parts of California have lower, lower rates. So, you know, that, that seems promising. So I did some analyses. Um, trying to, to categorize the data and adjust for it. And then I thought, oh, I'll just get, get what the average elevation of the counties are in California, which I was able to, to find uh, for 1913. I figured, well, now that's not going to change over time. Fortunately, this is like a, a rock solid thing because the counties haven't changed. And uh, found a trend, submitted the paper, and one of the re reviewers said, uh, where did you get this uh, altitude data? Because it doesn't necessarily make sense um, that you would use the average altitude of the county when people live at various parts of the county. Like it, it's not fair to use mean county elevation or a single point. And sure enough, when you look at where people live um, in California, most of them live in the lower areas. That's where all the, the big cities are um, and few people live in the mountainous areas. 
Um, and that, that's most pronounced in, in this uh, county here. Anybody recognize what this one is? You've, if you've ever driven to California, you've been through that city that's on the, on the right in, in the red. Um, that's Redding. And this is Shasta County. So Mount Shasta is very tall there. That's that, the first picture on the, the slide set was Mount Shasta. Um, if you use that as the uh, point of elevation, it would be like the, one of the highest points in California. But almost everybody, like 70% of the county lives in the greater Redding area, which is at only a few hundred feet elevation. So you can't just use the geographic altitude as your measure of where people are living or what altitude they're exposed to. So um, had to had to solve this problem. And uh, this is, is not psychiatry at all, so if you wanna you know, check your social media now, um, this, would, this would be a good time to do it, but I just gotta, gotta tell you the, uh, the methods. So they do publish uh, the US geological um, names, geographical names data is this monstrous data set of millions of uh, places and exactly what their altitudes are. There's 121,000 of them in California, and they include a specific name, like some, such and such elementary school, such and such city hall. And from that, you can pretty easily map <coughs> the um, cities and counties in California to all of these places that are habit, habitated. Um, so when, when you do that, uh, you can develop a list of uh, all the places that people are around and then use that as an average for the altitude for the whole city. So for Shasta County, there were like 22 places in Reading itself and then a, a few others in outlying cities. But when you use the averages, that means that you're averaging out roughly where people are rather than what the geographical formations are like. And this is an, some, some of the text out of that, that database, which includes um, the exact you know, longitude and latitude and the elevation and, and what the name is. So anyways, after you run through all that, um, I think those are reasonable estimates and looked at what the dementia related mortality rate was, you see that, that here again, there seems to be a, an effective altitude, but it's opposite of what the effects were on suicide, depression, and uh, cocaine or uh, methamphetamine use, and similar instead to ADHD, which is that there was a, a lower rate of uh, ADHD at higher altitudes. Um, and when you, when you control for all the relevant variables I could think of that, that made sense, like income, uh, race distribution, um, education, uh, the, the effect was in fact accentuated. So in an unadjusted model for every doubling in altitude, the rate of dementia death went down by one and a half percent. But in the adjusted models, it was more like 2%. So in the, the fully adjusted models, if you run all the numbers, the counties that were higher altitude had about a half the rate of dementia mortality compared to the lower counties. Yeah. I was just wondering if this was that same kind of problem that we talked about before. I mean, you know, where demented people go to die. Great, great question. And, and one of the reviewers brought that up that that it lists the location where they were. So if you move from a big city to further out and died there, that doesn't mean that you were exposed. So a uh, great point about confounding, um, and it's very hard to hard to resolve. So, yeah. So you mentioned the first part of your talk, but it was very interesting. Um, but if you look, so if someone looks at the places where people live at the sea now, which is like Peru, Ecuador. Great, great question. Um, the short answer is no. I mean, uh, pe people have, have not done the studies of uh, psychiatric disease at an extreme altitude, but I, I think it, it would be worth doing. Um, just a matter of gathering the right kind of data and then finding a, a reasonable com comparison set. Um, so good, good question. So to, to summarize all this, um, these were the, the domains that I asked you to consider initially. Um, and I still find it kind of surprising that there's such a heterogeneous effect of altitude across these different conditions. Like if it was really a lot of confounding by a single variable or something, I would expect a more linear relationship like that everything's worse at higher altitude or everything's better at higher altitude, but it sure looks like um, there, there are different effects depending on what you look at. 
So lower lower rates of dementia mortality and of ADHD, but higher rates of uh, depression, suicide, uh, substance abuse, and then uh, the medical differences are that there's less heart disease, but more uh, mortality related to lung disease. So across all these articles, um, there are many potential mechanisms proposed. And this is, is a short list. Um, and I wish I could tell you I understood this and that here's, here's really what's going on. But frankly, the, the, the more I read about this, the, the more confused I, I've gotten. So, you know, oxidative stress is clearly an effect. If you got less oxygen around, you're gonna have less oxygen free radicals or the compensatory systems that deal with oxygen free radicals maybe have other consequences on the, the cell that might have uh, you know, effects on neurotransmitters or, or fat vascularization, who knows what. Uh, you know, there's, the hematocrit definitely changes uh, with uh, living at high altitude. That's why these bikers who can't use EPO anymore, <coughs> bike bicycle racers, they spend most of their lives in um, low oxygen tents now, um, which is basically the same effect as EPO. So that, that may have effects on psychiatric disease, although I've, I've never seen any work suggesting that hematocrit is a predictor of uh, psychiatric illness. I uh, wish Dave Avery was here because I'm sure he could tell us um, how sleep changes, but there's a lot of literature about how uh, the sleep architecture is different, especially with acute um, altitude changes. If anybody's ever been up in the mountains, you, you know that it's, you're not quite sleeping right up there. Um, and, but even chronically, there are changes in sleep, and that might have downstream consequences. People have even been as specific to say that serotonin synthesis relies on oxygen saturation. So if you don't have enough oxygen around, you're not making enough serotonin, that's why you have, are more depressed and more likely to kill yourself. Um, that seems a little bit of a, a stretch and it assumes that there's not gonna be much acclimation. Um, and then the mitochondria have to work harder, especially with like phos phosphokinase if there's less oxygen around. Um, there's, there's also some evidence that at higher altitudes, uh, there's more fluctuations in brain pH as people acclimate, um, even chronically, that their, their brain pH is bouncing around more than at low altitudes. Nitric oxide has also been a, a main candidate, and uh, calcium homeostasis in cells apparently depends a lot on oxygen, which I didn't, I didn't know before. So I, I uh, was glad to see that somebody else had thought of the idea, even though they, they didn't have a, um, any epidemiologic data with regard to dementia and altitude. So this is a, a research group out of Russia who proposed, uh, uh, starting about 10 years ago, that um, hypoxia, that, uh, exposing people to lower oxygen, would prevent against dementia or even treat dementia. And they have a mouse model that they present as quite compelling. So, on the left are all the um, hypothesized mechanisms that are involved in dementia, um, Alzheimer's disease. I'm not sure there's really that much scientific consensus about these being the true causes, but then they suggest on the, the right side why these uh, causes are um, eliminated if you expose a person or an animal to higher altitude. So, at least uh, theoretically, there's biological plausibility. And when they've taken their mouse model of Alzheimer's and put these mice in hypobaric chambers, they, they have uh, proposed that the, the mice get better and all their brain changes go away. I tried contacting these guys. I, I uh, emailed Manukina Malishev and then the senior author on the other one. And um, they're at two different institutions in Russia. And all the emails got bounced back with the, the message that their mailboxes were full, which is really <laughs> suspicious. So I don't know if it's like the uh, high pressure mafia or something is uh, working to, to block their findings, but I, I'd, I'd love to hear what their, their thoughts are about this. So I wanna go through quickly, we don't have that much time on uh, some of the potential confounders uh, that, that could explain what's going on. There's all the sociodemographic effects of you know, people who live at higher places, smaller towns may just be different. Um, constitutionally, they may have different behaviors. Rurality itself uh, is a big deal. I want to touch on lithium. Air pollution it also may differ. That was one of the reviews for our paper said, you know, air, air pollution may be the, the 
source of all this issue, the temperature effects that you mentioned, uh, Marty, and there may be other environmental effects that we don't even know about. Yeah. Diet. Diet. Yeah, so that's a, a, that's part of the rurality or the lifestyle factors um, that definitely would have an effect. And came across uh, one, one piece that, that claimed that animals raised at higher elevations really provide a a, a very different nu nutrition substrate than animals at lower altitude. So um, could could be that whatever people are eating is different too. Um, air pollution had gotten a lot of popular press. This is an article in Mother Jones uh, magazine from earlier this year, and uh, they make a very splashy case that we have an epidemic of dementia because of air pollution and claim that scientists around the world agree on this and why aren't we acting on it, which I don't, I don't think is a fair characterization of the science because um, as far as I know, nobody's proved that there's a, a relationship with air pollution. So I tried to look into this and unfortunately, there's just too much measured for air pollution. Like unlike altitude, which you assume is fixed, air pollution varies from hour to hour by season and there's 26 different measures of air pollution that the, the California um, the Department of Air Quality measures uh, for like 4,000 locations throughout the state and each is sampled pretty much every day. So I, they, I called the guy and he nicely sent me a DVD with all their data for the last 10 years, but I um, was never able to make any single determination of, of what uh, uh, air pollution effect might be. I, I ran a couple of quick analyses looking at the, the number of days per year that each county was above the, the legal or the, the federally imposed uh, mandate uh, either for uh, particulate or ozone, which uh, seemed, seemed to be a, a reasonable proxy for air quality. And the graph on the left is uh, altitude and the graph on the, the x-axis and the graph on the right is the dementia-related mortality. Um, Boy, it must be seen an emergency in the hospital. Um, and, it, and it looks like at least for these two air pollution variables, there's no good relationship or strong relationship with either altitude or the rates of dying for the, from dementia, although maybe one of the other 24, or it may be that that has an effect, or it, it may be that you know, looking at the days above limit is, is not a good approximation. So I'm gonna need somebody uh, smarter than me to uh, help figure out the uh, air pollution stuff in order to produce an answer about whether that is a, a confounder. Um, lithium is just an interesting story. Uh, there, there's been a surprising amount of work looking at the relationship between lithium and dementia at altitude. Like the, the paper on top, um, they looked at how the pharmacokinetics of lithium changed after people went acutely to high altitude, which I, in a hundred years, I wouldn't have thought to look at that question, but they, they found that sure enough, uh, lithium um, pharmacokinetics are changed. And this made me you know, realize if you're treating somebody with lithium, you probably wanna ask them if they're planning to go to the mountains. Um, and if they are, you wanna think about monitoring them a little more carefully or maybe modifying their dose. Yeah, it looked like levels increased um, as, if, as people were acutely exposed, probably due to uh, kidney effects. Um, and then, a couple of groups have suggested that lithium may help prevent uh, Alzheimer's disease. This, this one I just get a kick out of. It's a systematic review and meta-analysis, and it was three trials. It's like, come on, you can't do a meta-analysis of three trials. Um, but, but sure enough, that's how they presented it, and when they ran all the numbers, they, they suggested that lithium may be a pre prevention for Alzheimer's disease. And this, that Gerhardt work, um, indicated that people who took lithium who have bipolar disorder had like a 25% lower risk of developing dementia. So possibly that's um, a, a part of the story, um, although it, I, I wasn't able to get any reliable data about lithium concentrations uh, in California. And then to come back to that, that problem I pointed out before with, with regard to the Austrian data where higher elevations had less lithium in the U.S. that seems to be exactly the opposite, and the uh, higher elevations have more lithium here. So I want to end just this with a, a, a summary um, that I'm, I'm sure you've figured out already, that 
unfortunately, looking at this data only produces more questions than it answers. And the real problem is that we just really don't understand the mechanisms for causa causation for any of our psychiatric diseases. And so when you add in another factor, it doesn't necessarily tell you what uh, is going on, nor do we really know what the mechanisms are for um, altitude changes. Like if you can't reliably figure out what the effect of altitude is on something like calcium homeostasis, or what the effect of calcium homeostasis is on any of our psychiatric illnesses, you're still very much guessing. So I tried to represent that in the figure to suggest that there may be a lot of effects on, at a cellular level of, of altitude, um, but that the effects on psychiatric disease are really heterogeneous and don't point towards any particular cause. And my ultimate uh, take home um, that is oversimplified, but I think is a useful analogy, when people ask me what causes dementia, I, I indicate that it's like losing or winning a game of bad luck bingo, where you have a certain number of things that line up, and when you have those line up, you get the start of cascade that, that is involved in dementia, and then you get progressive cell death. But we don't know exactly what all those things are, and some of them may be protective. Like they're the squares that are never blocked off, and it could be that high enough altitude is one of those protective factors that makes it less likely that everything else is going to be lined up. Um, but there's there's still definitely a lot to learn, and um, I would, if any of you were interested in uh, looking at uh, rates of any psychiatric or other condition in uh, altitude, please let me know. I'd love to, uh, to to look at the data with you or. If you didn't want to work with me, I'd be glad just to give you the data and you could uh, look, at, look at it yourself. But, but I, I think that uh, there's a lot to, to learn and hopefully uh, when we get a better understanding of this, it'll help us to understand better what's going on with the conditions we treat. Yeah, Brian. The Austin data is pretty amazing. That they have the they have data for 99 different devices. I wonder if they have anything comparable to the suicide study in terms of Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> That's yeah. You know th those uh, European systems have a lot of good public health data, and it would be worth checking with them. Ruth Cohen, I'm, she's not here, but her her brother, I guess, is an epidemiologist, and she was saying that in Switzerland they've got a lot of very good public health data, and she thought there was quite a lot of altitude. A lot of these people do live in villages their whole lives. They stay there. There's a lot of population. A lot of people. It's not like our population will be around so much. Yeah, that's a, a, that would be a, a great study. I, I, I think it'd also be very interesting to, to look at decades of life or where you spent your time because we still don't know really what when people are at risk for developing Alzheimer's. I mean, like Paul and I have talked about this that you know, maybe in your 30s or 40s that is, is really the key time that the changes happen and they take a long time to develop. So if somebody you know lived at a certain altitude for most of their life and then moved there in later life, does that increase their risk or is it where they spent their childhood? So both the people who stayed put and who moved would be a really interesting case. Yeah, Paul. Oh, yes. So um, <clears throat> have a lot of worries about the kind of mixed urban and rural populations and try comparing things. As you know, people are not evenly distributed, be it genes, be it lifestyles, be it anything. So I'm just wondering, did you ever, can you use the California data to match cities? Say, can you find, mm. uh, I mean, I mean, you can't match anything in LA because it's too big, but, but are there other cities of 1 million to 100,000 within California that you could start matching and seeing if the connection rates are different? That, that's a great idea. Yeah, and instead of taking the, the whole county to well, it's a, not to yeah. for things, but it just might pick out that urban rural and might have better data because cities keep very good data and even within the city, you probably have well, boroughs, do some work, whatever. You'd have different areas that you could try to uh, control for things to make sure there's nothing funky with the data. Yeah, I, th I think your, your point is, is a great one. And, and also, ultimately, what you'd want is like a zip code level an analysis. And there's probably data sets out there that are like that. So that's a, a great idea because, like, like you say, no matter what known demographic variables you control for, you're probably not going to truly control for, for the, the differences between bigger and smaller cities.
Yeah, because there may be a pollution level correlation with altitude too, although I think it'd be hard to show, but I'm just guessing if there's less and higher altitude, more and lower altitude. Yeah, I, that's, that's, I, was, I expected more of a trend. So this is the, um, out on the left, the altitude and then the ozone and particulate levels. Um, but this was just a, a very rough measure and there are probably other pollution variables um, that differ. But we did a study about 20 years ago where we looked at the people coming into the ER and looked at correlates. And the only thing correlated was the overall pollution level in the, the area. Interesting. The problem is when we tried to put out some grant supports, they were like five different places to measure. It's very hard to know what a person's exposure is. Yeah, you almost have to have them wear a, a little sensor around. So, yeah, the effects of, of smog are certainly important, but you can't assume it's a smog all over the place. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I see she had her hand back out first. Have you thought about pulling the VA system? Uh -huh. Have you thought about pulling the VA and like the CMS data, like to pass these people have been in for some of the decades? I know the age differential might be a little bit hard to say when their onset was, but you can track back to these people who've moved around or like where That's they were a, 10 years yeah. ago. Yeah. And huh. like correlate that, like they're saying they've lived in LA or they lived in like a rural city, if you can like match that to their altitude right. so years ago or currently. If a, a, yeah, the VA definitely is a system that keeps track of where you are. So like, like, would that be possible huh. or would it be No, I think, yeah, I'm, for that? I don't see what would hold, hold you from doing that. Because uh, then that would, would give you an idea of at least what their mailing address was over a period of time. That's a great idea. Look into that. Steven, um, oh, yeah, sure. Okay. But uh, I hope that you'll come and speak with us again in two thousand and twenty-two. Yeah. Because I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.